fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCA 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. And of course, I'm Al Warren, Mr. Michael Hawley's on, on the co host plate today. That yeah. is correct. So what's going on? So your your wife hasn't killed you yet, and you're doing all that Not, work around the house, right? That's the that remodeling. the uh, The fireplace is looking good, so uh, yeah, that's what uh, I'm doing, and and do a little bit of uh, research as well, like I always do. Yeah, but that's good because you're you're doing well. You know, it's once you make a mistake in that remodeling, you know, you're in the doghouse. <laughs> oh yeah, well I'm using the doghouse anyways. I think that's just a male thing. Yeah, uh, you know, I just you yeah. know, yes, dear, sometimes. Yeah, but your wife can kill a man at 10 paces. That is true. She uh, she was a nationally rated judo player, so she's a toughie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wouldn't mess with her. My <laughs> God, that's like pretty fierce. Um, anyway, speaking of fierce, okay, now we're going to be talking to a mystery writer here. And uh, uh, he's got an accent, so he must be from like England or something. So uh, Mr. <laughs> Mark Edwards Langley, thank you for coming on the show. Great to be here. Thank you, Ellen. Yeah. So, Mark, um, it looks like you got a couple of books out here. And before we get into it, let's, what's your history? Like, how how did you get into writing books, period? Like, what started you? Oh, my, we have to go back decades and decades. Um, initially, back about my early 80s, I uh, started working in a bookstore in Houston, Texas, and at that time, I think the show Spencer for Hire with Robert York was on television. I was talking about how much I loved the show. And one of the women I was working with said, well, if you love the show, you should really read the books. So I started picking up the Parker novels and reading those, fell in love with those. Uh, went from there to Mickey Spillane and John D. McDonald, you know, and uh, Tony Hillerman. So I think I, I started to get the bug all those years ago by reading those writers and it somehow stuck with me that I, I think I could do this and I wanted to do this. But uh, over the years of trying to do something, not even knowing what I was doing, um, let things lie and then pretty much, you know, took it up again. Um, boy, in the mid to late 90s and started making up characters. And I took a trip out to uh New Mexico, Arizona, through Montana, what I was going to do for the first book, dictating off into a Panasonic tape recorder, everything I saw, smelled, felt, whatever. And then uh, after a two-week trip, came back home, wrote it all down, and started developing storylines and characters. And that first book, Path of the Dead, uh, was originally called Navajo Wind, but it uh, went through several different incarnations before I finally got it to where I so you've always wanted to do mystery fiction as well then? Yeah. I mean, I, it just intrigued me so enough. I, I, I never read much of anything else but that. And uh, I just love the genre. I've enjoyed the genre. And I thought, well, maybe I could do this. Hope against hope, you know, that uh, something would, would come to, to fruition. And, um, you know, about 25 years later, it did. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Robert Urich. Yeah. He was a, I was, I really liked him too. And he died pretty young of cancer, you know? Yeah, pretty, he did. That was, a, that was a very sad thing. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was kind of a shock actually. I was surprised. Um, uh, but I always say there's always something that makes you as a writer decide that you can publish a book. Like usually there's some sort of an event, like you, you, you know, you like a lot of this stuff stuff and you start writing it, but what was it that gave you the courage, let's say, to go, well, I'm going to shop this out. I'm going to have it published or I'm going to self-publish or I'm going to let everybody in the world see my my writing. Like what 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 is it that 
gave you that push? I guess you might say I've always had the drive to do that. And um, going through the years, working on it, working on it. And it took a long time, I think, for me to actually find my voice in the writing. So it felt natural. It felt easy. It felt good, you know, and um, got it all set where I wanted it. And I decided, well, uh, at the end of 2016, when I retired, um, I told my wife, I'm going to try to get this published. And I looked online and went through several different uh, uh, people on there. And I emailed, like I think, 17 different agents and sample chapters and sent to them and um, got the usual responses of, well, thank you very much, yada, yada, you know. Uh, one, right. one agent actually called me from New York. And um, I talked to him for about a half hour or so. And then he told me, he says, I, I get about 200, you know, chapters across my desk every month. And yours is the first one I've liked in the last six months. So he says, do you have the rest of the book finished? I said, yeah, I do. He will send me that and I'll get back to you on Monday. So I sent him the rest of the book and Monday came and he emailed me. So I'm going to call you at three o'clock, three o'clock. My phone rang and he said, I want to take you on. So sweet. He, yeah, it's, it's amazing when things start to domino. You never can stop it, you know. And uh, he said, well, I'm going to submit the book to about six publishers, and we'll see what happens. I'll let you know. I said, fine. So uh, he did. And then I remember I was done cutting the grass one day, and I got back in. My phone rang, and he says, do you have a minute? I says, yeah. He says, well, I'm about to make tax time a little hard for you. I'm like, okay, you know. So he submitted it to six, and then one decided, Blackstone Publishing, that they would publish it. And he told me that he had gotten me a two-book deal. Great. Wow. That's good. Um, you don't look old enough to be retired. <laughs> well, I'm 62 right now. Yeah, yeah. You have, you have kind of a, a younger face, so that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of interesting. What made you get into this story now like what what this this is uh you've got uh three books out now in this series and your newest one is called when silence screams right um so to get into writing a series like that there must be you know something in the theme or the story that's really important to you or some reason why you're you're kind of centered around this storyline and characters well, yeah, I mean, I remember taking a trip out with my parents when I was 12 back in 72 out west and down the Four Corners area and so forth. And uh, for some reason, it just struck me then that this is a wondrous place. I, I fell in love with the land uh, and the people, of course, you know, and I years go by and years go by, went back out there for the, the trip uh, to get information for the first book. And then the minute I got down into the Four Corners area, I felt like I was home. And it's one of those things that just my body just relaxed. And I go, ah, I'm home. And I love that area. I love the people. I love talking to them and, and being around uh, all those uh, things down there. And I just, it's, it's in my blood. I can't get out of New Mexico for some reason. <laughs> Let's talk about the basic premise of this mystery series. What, what is the basic idea behind it? Uh, basic idea is Arthur Nakai, um, the main character in that, um, was 10 years in the Marines, 12 years as part of a CBP as a Border Patrol in an actual group that exists called the, uh, the Shadow Wolves, which is a 15-man Native American group that tracks drugs and so forth across the border in Arizona. And then after all that is done, he developed his own life in northwestern New Mexico, running an outfitting business, giving people backcountry rides and so forth. Met his wife, a uh, uh, news person out there, weekend anchor and so forth. So she has a lot of things to help him out with that. But then I basically wanted to focus on their life together, uh, coming back from the death of their first child. Um, getting him involved in her being uh, taken by a serial killer that had escaped from New Mexico or Arizona uh, over to New Mexico there, got her just happenstance, you know, and then he 
uses all of his tracking skills and his gut feelings to track them from the Four Corners area to the mountains of Montana, where he enlists one of his uh, uh, shadow wolf buddies to help track them down. How do you, um, with Nakai, for instance, it, it, how do you create a character like that? How does this work for you? Is this something that you take from within of yourself and build on it, or it's just a completely out of body sort of character that you've created. It's one of those things. I think, you know, where I had a, a particular idea that I wanted him to have a military background and a border patrol background to be able to use throughout the books, what he's learned in those fields. And um, I kind of built him from scratch. Uh, his name went through different changes until I settled on Arthur Nakai. And uh, I just developed him, gave him a backstory uh, gave him a present story. I already have like, there's on the fourth one now, there's six more titles I have written down along with synopsis for each of those books uh, subsequent to come. But uh, I just developed the characters. And I think character is what drives a book, no matter what it is, if it would be a movie or whatever. Character is what people fall in love with. They love them, they hate them, whatever it may be. But um, I think I wanted to develop Arthur as a strong character. Uh, his wife is a strong person and give them a world to live in with all the people that surround that and, uh, and just see what happens because um, I do things backward. I've been told I develop a title first. I think of that and then create a story around that title. So um, a lot of different things happen, but I wanted Arthur to be not really a, a part of me, but it's weird that when you're writing him, and any other character in my new book too. But as much as you think and plan and write out, uh, you know, synopses and, and chapter outlines and so forth, the characters inevitably will speak for themselves and take you in directions you didn't even think about. Yeah, and that's always a point I like to talk to people about. Uh, fiction writers have this um, character that they've created. And whereas I think both... Michael and I do nonfiction. So we're kind of dealing with real people and, and the things they've done and their life. So it's, it's not like we get to uh, fantasize or think about them in a different light. Um, so when you experience your character, like Nakai or any, any of your others, how do you experience them? Is this, is this voice? Is it, do you hear the voice of the character? <laughs> Why not? It's always crazy because we get people that say that. They experience them like it's visual and they see it's like a movie playing or they hear voices or they hear all this sort of stuff. So what, what's your, how do you explain that? Exactly right. I mean, when I'm sitting here writing uh, either dialogue or whatever it may be, I see it in my head. I, I'm, I'm like watching a movie in my head and my things are typing down what I see and what I hear. Um, they have voices of their own. Now they're three books and they develop their own persona, we'll say, you know, but uh, if I have things written down as to what I want to do, they will think, no, I don't think I want to do that. I should be doing this, you know, and um, things just pop up and I, I change things, but I know where I'm going. Sometimes I'll write, you know, the last part of the chapter, uh, part of the last chapter, you know, uh, as I'm like six chapters in. So I know where I'm going. I have to get there is, is the point of that. But um, they just are in my head and I'll hear them talking and write it down. You know, I think I have a mug that calls writer's block uh, the part where my invisible people stop talking to me. <laughs> How about on the, the flip side, your antagonist, you said that uh, your first book uh, was a serial killer. And mm -hmm. then uh, uh, Al and I love that part because we researched <laughs> that. And then so question, oh, yeah. do uh, are your antagonists going to always be serial killers or other kind of violent offenders? Well, that tended to work out with I, I delved into each each book i write i have about a three or four inch ring binder of uh of research that i do and and, and things written down and jotted down out of my out of my head but i researched a lot you know ted bundy and so forth and a lot of them and listened to how they talk about what they did and how they treated things and how their their whole mindset was so that got me thinking about the character um Kinesawa in the book 
And I wanted to make him kind of that cold. I wanted to make him that matter of fact. I wanted to make him um, something when you read it, it would like chilled a little bit because you didn't think anybody could be that way. But when you, you would know for yourself for sure, when you watch the interviews and interrogations with these people, how just nonchalant they are. And yeah. I wanted to put that into uh, that story with the aspect of, you know, I look at Path of the Dead as a story of two men, Arthur and Leonard Kanesawa. And having grown up in different states, but both being native, um, they turned out differently because of the way they were raised and their family either one could be the other raised in that situation. Um, so I just had to reach into myself and, and all the research I had done and formulate this character that, uh, that you just love to hate because there are times you can feel for him and what he's talking about. And there's times that you utterly hate him, you know, but uh, that's how that one started. So it's, um, I do so a lot of research and, and get things done. Like you had to pull out the dark side of you, huh? And then uh, bring that definitely, out. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Cause there, there were uh, watching all the interviews and, and reading things about the, the serial killers themselves. It's just like, it, it's just amazing how they are and can think. And I wanted to get that across, you know, in, in this character, but uh, it was a pretty dark place there for a while trying to, to be him. Cause it's not when you're writing fiction, you have to be every character you have in the book. So you're constantly changing and changing and changing back and thinking different things. Sometimes at the same time uh, when they're holding conversation or whatever. So I had to be Arthur's wife. I had to be the serial killer. I had to be so many different people in that. Um, so you took a few people out then and then uh, you, you actualize those murders. How was it? <laughs> just <laughs> not just kidding. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> oh yeah, no, 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 no latent tendencies here. Yeah, that's oh, right. Too bad. <laughs> well, so when you're experiencing your characters and stuff like that, you, you know, hearing, hearing, and watching and stuff like that, do you ever kind of like wake up in the middle of the night and find a shovel beside your bed or something? Or <laughs> no, 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 nothing, nothing like that at all. Yeah, but um... oh, come on, tell us the truth. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's just you know, it's it's one of those things where. Um... I mean, I look for things to fit certain characters I want to have. Um, like the, the third book, uh, When Silence Screams there, that uh, I know what I wanted to do with the missing and murdered indigenous women. I found out 5,712 went missing in 2016 alone. That prompted me to research more wow. about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was the first year they kept records on that, too. It was amazing. Um, I researched more about that. I found their website online. And when you look at that number, it's a number. When you go to their website and you see all the flyers they have on there of all these missing girls and women, um, it definitely puts a face to the number, puts a name, puts an age, you know, and so forth. And it starts to hit me. I printed out a lot of them, so I have a reference of all these these. Uh, girls and women that went missing to draw from in the book and I wanted to mix that with then the current issue all the time of you know how teenage girls or boys get lured online by a fake profile and in this case this 19 year old girl gets lured online uh, away from her family in Santa Fe is never seen again and uh, I followed that with than the sex trafficking trade that uh, is so abundant across the world, not just in, in the States or anywhere, but um, how she gets sold off into that and moved around and things happen and so forth. And what is remarkable to bring up serial killers again, um, one of the characters in the book, the last one that she's found with, I based on a real uh, serial killer named John Edward Robinson. And he was the first, what they call, internet serial killer uh, online where he would uh, have his online profile. His name was Slave Master, you know, and so forth. He's from the Midwest. This guy had a wife and four kids and a job. He ran his own business, you know, and he was secretly heavily into BDSM. So 
I built I built the main the character at the end on this guy um, because over what uh, eighty four to around two thousand when he finally got caught uh, he had killed multiple women and sometimes their daughters uh, in that too Jeez. it is you know he a forty two year old woman fifteen year old daughter did them both you know um, he ended up when they finally caught him. Um, he would go online, pitch things online, find women that were into the same kind of thing, and then meet them at a bar somewhere or whatever, get them back to a motel room, do what they had to do, um, and then kill them. And what he ended up doing was sticking their bodies in 55-gallon drums and putting them on his property, hiding them under the ground, um, in garages. He even had a bunch of them in storage units that he purchased uh, when they found all the rest of them there, but uh, it's just amazing. They, 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 I say, they live among us and we don't know it. It could be anybody at your church yeah. or whoever else in the world, you know, somebody you think is, is great or whatever, but they have this side you don't know about. So I built the last character in the book that had uh, April Minigoats as this kind of guy here. And then Arthur would have to try to we, we weave his way through finding the first person who actually had the online profile that took her and then follow her path after that to end up where he ends up in the books with this guy. And uh, it's, you know, like you say, it is, it is a dark area to get into. Um, not every book will be about that kind of a thing, but there is, I felt it was necessary for the basis of the story and it's won a couple of awards so far. It's up for the Silver Falchion Award at uh, Killer Nashville on the 20th here. So hopefully I might uh, be able to, to snag that one, you know. But um, right. people either read it and you're maybe disgusted by it or whatever. But it's the truth. It's truth wrapped in fiction because people need to know that this exists. And um, I wanted to do it in a format where... It was a great story. You felt for the characters. You wanted the girl to, to fight for herself and survive. You wanted Arthur to come along and find her at some point, you know, and, and the whole trip through the entire book. Uh, I hope I did that. And I hope people uh, enjoy it. And a lot of people do so far. Yeah. And I guess in a sense, the good thing is that you can um, take some truth and have a better ending or, a, you know, a more palatable ending than yeah. like what we write here. It's, we don't really, we can't do that. It is what it is. It'd be nice if you could make it better than it is. But so in a yeah. way, um, doing a fiction around truth, like historical fi fiction style, um, you can make it a, maybe, I don't want to say happier, but just a, a more pleasing or more satisfying end to the story. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, you, it, it steadily builds tension throughout the entire book, which is good. If everything leads to something else, leads to something else and so on, you know, but uh, I think my second book was uh, Death Waits in the Dark, and that dealt with um, drilling and fracking in native lands and so forth, and where the first love of Arthur, uh, her, two son, her two sons end up getting murdered, and she wants him to find out the who and the why. And that takes him on a whole different route through all that as well. So um, a lot of Native people that I talk to love the fact that I am talking about things that they're affected with on a daily basis. And uh, I'm glad to have their support. And uh, a lot of them have helped me out uh, with certain things about, you know, history and so forth and uh, and clans and that kind of thing. But uh, I, I look to them for, if I don't know anything, I will ask them and they will give back to me with answers, which I can use, which is good because I, uh, I I love their input. Yeah, it's important to have their interaction and the support and have them during the, especially during the uh, research parts. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. For sure. Yeah. And uh, you, you, you know, Michael's... Um, Online name is Slave Master. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Al, don't tell anybody. You're not supposed to tell anybody. <laughs> just so you know, everybody, just just type in Slave Master, and he's he's there. You know. uh, lately, it's called Silver Slave Master because he's well, you know, yeah. 
Yeah. Silver Fox, ladies and Silver Fox. Right. <laughs> yeah, he's, mov- he's moving up in the world. Well, that's <laughs> right. I have to say that, okay, so it seems like, you know, you talk about fracking and the missing uh, natives and stuff like that. When you're, when you're kind of going into these areas, um, you know, you're kind of dealing with the real subjects of what's going on in our world. Um, is this sort of a subtext or maybe a something you want readers to get from the books it, 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 besides the entertainment value besides the mystery and all that when that's all going on and it's a good story and they're entertained it, do you have kind of a some some point you you hope readers take away well i i look at writing the books like i i don't put in i don't put my aspect of what i think in there i show several different points of view and let the reader just decide what they want to decide um but i do want to hopefully raise awareness in a lot of things and 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 get people to look at something uh in a different point of view um I like to say that America is not just black and white. It's so many different variations that are out there. And I want the people to relate to Arthur and his wife as a couple, not just Native American or whatever, but I want them to relate to the couple, the struggles they have. And that's one of the constant little threads that run through all the books is their life together and the ups and downs that everybody has within their marriage and so forth uh, along with that. So they can feel and and relate to them as people. So I think that, you know, when they sit down and read a book, everybody who's read the books so far has fallen in love with those characters. Um, My wife actually loves the character of the sheriff, Jake Villagody in there. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a, he, she likes him, but uh, she wants to marry him as a matter of fact, too. Uh-oh. So <laughs> you you'll, have the... to do, you'll have to do me in first. You know? yeah. Well, that's easy. <laughs> that's, that's book four. <laughs> yeah, well, how first. about that book four? What, which, uh, is it, it's the same protagonist. Your, your book four, your, you have a book four, you said, right? Right, I'm working on that right now. I'm about eight chapters into that, and that one is uh, going to be centering around uh, methamphetamine use on the reservations um, that Arthur has to find out where it's coming from, how to deal with it, uh, based on uh, a thought I had that Arthur and his wife are driving home from visiting her father in Kayenta, Arizona, and in the headlight beams, as they're talking, they see this person kind of stumbling side to side and then falls over in the road. And uh, due to the distances and lack of, you can't call an ambulance to have it be there in five minutes. You know, it's like maybe a half hour or more away. They throw him in the back of Arthur's truck, run him to the hospital and find out that he's overdosed on meth and so forth. And he's been jittering and all the things that it entailed with that. I had to talk to a couple of doctors about treatment in the hospital to find out what the course of procedure would be to make it accurate. But um, that's going to be involving that. And I'm not really sure where I'm heading with that. I have a, a, a end written that may get there. It may not uh, be a different <laughs> than you when I get there, but uh, I'm trying to get right now a lot of uh, files I submitted a a FOIA request with the FBI on certain things because I have three people I want to look at and base things on what happened with that. And that's one thing, too, that I do. Um, The files that I do have, I use as basis for some of the storylines. Like I got a uh, for the medical examiner in in my book series, I got like 100 pages of autopsy reports from uh, UNM uh, about the medical examiner out there uh, to see procedure and how they do things and what's done with that. Uh, I'm trying to request the new files for thing. Uh, The new book, the new series, uh, first book is called Bloodlines. And uh, I looked around for something that hadn't been done just yet. I didn't want it to be, you know, a, a sheriff in Wyoming or a, a you know, a, a, a national park guy or whatever, you know, uh, I wanted something to be different. And I stumbled across 
a job that I researched and nobody had written about yet. So I got in touch with the deputy director of that organization and talked with him for a long time. He answered all my questions. So I got everything written down and he actually sent me about six different case files from them to look at and go through. And I kind of work those together as one storyline in the new series of books, which I'm 15 chapters into now. So that uh, I hope is going to work out really well and uh, and see the light of day too, because it's, uh, I love doing this. I mean, you write as well. So it's like, you, I cannot stop doing this. <laughs> I yeah, just, yeah. I, I have this part of me that needs to get something said, needs to get it out, uh, perhaps make people think about certain things in their lives and so forth. But uh, sometimes it's not really based on that, but just, I want to get a good story down. I want to get something people can get involved with and read and just get caught up in. Yeah. Yeah. It's that, it's the new book. Is that based on a guy out of Buffalo slave master? Slave master. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> he, he sells meth, methamphetamines. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it no. To be on the radio. A, yeah. It's, it's a different, it's a different uh, situation with that, but uh, it, it's, it's coming along pretty well. So I'm trying to do both books at once. This is kind of hard to do. You, yeah, if I get stuck cool. on one, I go yeah. to the other one, you know? Yeah. Well, that's kind of a good thing. I do that, but, but you know, um, I understand that. It's kind of nice to do the other thing while it gives you a break. Do you, are you planned out? So I was interested in this too. When you get a, a person that's writing a series and it's, um, there is some truth, but you're, you're doing a, it's a mystery. You're kind of, if there's fiction to your, so do you kind of have it all planned out in your head? Like, you know, how many books you're going to do with, let's say these characters like Nakai and stuff. Do you kind of already know, like you've got 10 books planned and each one kind of, and then you kind of fill it, or is this something that you just play by ear as it goes? Actually, no, with the Arthur and the Kai series, I have uh, six more after this, like I said, uh, titles already written down and outlines of the stories written down. They may change as when I get to them, who knows, you know, but uh, I have ideas of what I want to do with all of those. Uh, the new series, I have the one book I'm working on right now. Um, I'm hoping I can come up with different things involving this character because it's going to be kind of a little bit difficult to get him involved in a lot of things. But since he can be, you know, cross certified uh, with the state police and so forth, there's more uh, leeway to develop characters and storylines with that because he can work that way as well. So um, I'm, I'm hoping it can be good, but, uh, you know, We'll see how that goes. And I love it so far. My wife has been reading all my work uh, before I send it in, you know, and she has read this and she just cannot believe it. That's sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's always, I find that interesting. How long does it take you to put together one of these books? Uh, with research, probably about three or four months of research and then probably a good six months or so of, of sitting down and writing. Um this one's taking a little bit longer right now with that, but I had a good six months uh, of day-to-day writing to get something done after I get it all lined out and outlined. Yeah. How do you keep track of all your characters? Like, you know, over so many <laughs> books uh, and so many things and going on, like, and, and to make sure you don't miss something that subtle, you know, that a character does in one book and then many books later, they're sort of something different, right? Like, how, how do you do that? Or do you just have a good memory? Well, I have had to, while I was doing the third book there, I've had to go back to the first two books and kind of pick up where I saw things and I go, oh, yes, right, that's right. Yeah, you know, it's hard to keep a lot of things in line when you're constantly writing things down. Thank God for the note section of my phone, you know, because I have like 500 and some odd notes in there of just things that pop into my head to write down. Otherwise, I will forget them and I'll never see the light of day. Um so where do you see yourself in 10 years? Where, what's going to happen to uh, to Mark in 10 years? Are you going to be like uh, doing TV series and tons of books and signing <laughs> autographs? Like where, where do you see yourself? Uh, I hope that uh, I can make a good living at it, you know, and it's uh, going to turn out well and, and be something that uh, I've been doing several book signings and so forth. Uh, the last one was a uh, Saturday or two ago at Barnes and Noble and uh, had a lot of people. Strangest thing happened there was um, 
I'm sitting at the, t- at the table, you know, and doing books and so forth. And this one girl was eyeing me over there, you know. And then she had the nerve to come up and she says, she says, my, my sister loves all of your books. Oh, that's great. I said, is she here? She said, no, she's in New York. I said, okay, that's, that's too bad, you know. And then she goes away and so forth. And I see her watching me again, but she's on the phone. So then she walks over and she goes, remember I said my sister was in New York? And I says, yeah, sure. And she says, well, I got her on the phone and she, she did a FaceTime and put it right in my <laughs> face. And we, we talked back and forth with her sister, which was great, you know. But uh, it's amazing that, you know, when things happen like that, you go, wow, this is, this is going to be something pretty amazing that, uh, you know, you reach people enough that they, they want to be a part of a lot of things. So I, for her to, to put her, call her sister, put her on the phone and do a FaceTime back and forth with me was, uh, was an amazing thing. It was probably part of the FBI, and they were doing an investigation on you. <laughs> you live in Florida, yeah. Mark? Do you live in Florida? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Just wondering. <laughs> Not at all, no. Um, one of the strange things, too, was, uh, you know, I, I get a lot of things on my LinkedIn, uh, because I have a LinkedIn for my business days. And um, I noticed one day, I, I put it on Facebook, I said, should I be worried? Because one of the people that looked at my profile on LinkedIn said it was from the DOJ. <laughs> uh, you just never know what's going to go on. No, <laughs> That's right. That's all. I got you again. Do you like social media? Do you like the, this new world of, of all of this interaction with people? And so readers and people can, can find you much easier and they can say things, you know, like you're book is good or your book sucks or whatever like you have all this interaction do you do you like doing that with with readers oh yeah definitely yeah i mean they can uh people email me through my website and they join the website and so forth and be part of members only you know but uh i do a lot of uh been asked to do a lot of uh uh, book club takeovers and i talk with a ream of people there uh they ask a lot of good intelligent questions and i love getting back to all those people with answers and I kind of develop a rapport with readers with, that are that are on there. And I actually had one guy who did a five star review on Amazon and just blew me away when he said he would rank Arthur Nakai right up there with Joe Pickett and Walt Longmire. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> uh, that's nice. To yeah. have somebody say that is like amazing. And he's one of my best fans. And yeah. 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 Well, that's that's nice of your family to do that. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, not that. I'm not a family person. Yeah, he's just, um, he's a, he's, you know, I, I, the thing is, one of the good things was that uh, uh, with the first book, you know, Craig Johnson did a blurb, cover blurb for that, the first blurb there. And then he put on his website, his page, uh, Facebook page, the, the blurb on there. And he said, me, because <laughs> he said it, you know. And then as a result of that, I had like almost over 4,000 people buy the book like that. You know, I was like, whoa, you know, yeah. but uh, to have the authors and I, I contacted Ann Hillerman for a blurb for the second book, William Kent Kruger, who did an amazing blurb for that second book. And um, I hope I can live up to their their praise. Yeah, I mean, no, that's great. That's great. Good to have that. What is your website and what? how do you like people to contact you then? Uh, they can go through that, which is markedwardlangley.com. One word, markedwardlangley.com. Um, you can join, like I said, the members only and get, uh, you know, free access to a lot of exclusive content uh, with that. Once a month, I try to do uh, a snippet of the latest book I'm working on so they can get a kind of an idea about that. They can go to uh, from there, my Facebook page, my Instagram page and Twitter page and LinkedIn and so forth. But uh, just click on the icons there and it takes you right to those and, and join those. And I have a lot of fun uh, talking to a lot of fans uh, most every day. Great. Of course, we'll have that up so people can find it easily, you know, one click. Yeah. Um, so when, you, um, when you're writing, uh, are you the type of guy that sits down and kind of goes, okay, well, I can write from 10 to 2 today. There's nobody home. And, and you can just sit down and write. Can you plan your day like that? Or do you have to be in the right mood? Well, it is. I mean, uh, for for fiction like I'm doing, it has. I have to have that, that mindset to sit here and work through what I need to work through and get things written down. 
Um, I used to with the first book. I was writing at night. I'd stay up till sometimes one in the morning to get to something because the juices get flowing and you can't stop, you know. Um, anymore, um, I try to maybe get up early in the morning, 5.30 or so, take the dog out, you know, make some coffee and sit down and try to pick up where I left off. But you really have to put yourself back in that persona of it would be dialogue or whatever. Um, they have, you have to put yourself in that world again and pick up where you left off. And sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard, but uh, I like to do it mostly in the morning, sometimes at night anymore. But uh, whenever I have that impetus to sit down with an idea, then I go for it, either writing it down or going back to the book and, and changing some things in a previous chapter or paragraph or whatever to make it sound a little better and be more exactly what I wanted to say. Um, so it's basically a morning time, um, rarely at night anymore, but basically I write in the morning. Yeah. Oh, so outside world. So when things are stressful and weird and, and there's a lot of stress going on or like the pandemic and stuff and all that stuff, does that affect you when you're writing or can you just act accordingly and just kind of go on as normal? Actually, the pandemic didn't do much of anything uh, at all with my mindset for that. You know, yeah, I was still going out doing things and going to the stores and so forth, coming back home and writing. I mean, so it didn't have any real effect uh, as far as that goes. But, you know, it's you just sit here and you have to do it and nothing really outside world wise comes in. But sometimes like my dad said, if you get struck with something and you can't figure a way out, just get up go away, do something else, you know, uh, if I go out in the garage and clean the garage or do things like that, you know, um, work around the house, uh, doing some things and getting some things finished up, uh, renovation wise or whatever, sometimes, you know, but, uh, then I come back with fresh eyes and look at it and go, that's what I want to say, you know, so I'll yeah. sit down and redo it and structure it differently. But, uh, uh, one of the best things I came across was a, um, a list of words, that you don't think you use a lot, but you do. And then I started going through my manuscript, looking for those specific words. And it was so true. It's words that are there, but you don't really need in the sentence and just clogs things up. And I went back through there and restructured that and removed all those. And sometimes you'll find a different way of saying it where you get the point across without so many words. Uh, so I worked out great for that but i'm always learning uh whether it be reading online or writer's digest or somewhere you know but uh just to sit there and do it i'll be i'll be funny i'll be reading like ann hillerman's book or somebody's book and thinking to myself i wouldn't have said it that way <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I right. wonder where, you know but you you change things you know but uh and then i read my own book too sometimes i'll go back through one of them and i'll go well i, I could have said this better yeah. No, but yeah. it's too late at that point. So yeah. do, is there a time where you finally just commit and say, I can't look at it anymore, and then you submit it? Or is it one of those things where you kind of go back and forth, go back and forth, and you uh, then almost ruin it <laughs> if you go too oh, hard? Oh, man, I, I'll tell you, because I, there, there are times when I will write a chapter and go through a next one and then go back two chapters and read through it again. Or luckily have my, my laptop read it back to me because what your mind thinks it sees may not be there, but the computer will tell you exactly what's there and read it back to you. Nah, it doesn't sound right. That, that's where you made a mistake where it left something out, you know, but uh, I like to go back and, and do that. It's it's hard to to not edit and edit and edit again, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It, it comes to a point when you go, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think I'm done now. I need to stop, do this, or I'll go on forever, get it off to an editor, and then submit it. You know, yeah. Where I saw, where I made it, a lot of corrections is when I did a book on one of my books on audio. And when you read it aloud, you realize, oh my gosh, I, I need two editors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, yeah, yeah. Silver Fox is getting old. <laughs> That's well, right. Was, that's where I was lucky because uh, Blackstone had sent me four people reading my first book uh, and wanted me to choose which one I wanted to have do the audio books. And my wife and I both listened to them and we settled on Bronson Pinchot because 
the way he read it. The other ones were like reading it, yes, verbatim, whatever. But being the actor, he brought in inflections. He brought in feeling, you know. So um, we went with him, and it's been a, a joy every time he's done one of my books. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Slave he will master. bring him to life. Yeah. That's so you don't want the slave master, huh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Something about that won't work. You know, stay away, <laughs> stay away from that. You know, that's yeah. right. It's crazy. Especially stuff. his website. He's got methamphetamine all over it. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, he fracks to get meth. <laughs> that's uh, right. Yeah. Wow. So that's interesting. And, and okay, so what, who, what do you do for uh, uh, kind of inspiration? And it doesn't have to be writers. It can be music. It can be, or it could be movies, or do you like to go fishing? What do you, you know, besides read my books, uh, what do you do for inspiration? <laughs> um, well, it's hard to put yours down. You know? yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. They, now you're getting it. <laughs> yeah, they, but you know, I, I do listen to a lot of music. I listen to a lot of different variations of music. You know, sometimes when I'm writing, I'll have, you know, uh, Native American fleet music on or a number of different things, uh, smooth jazz or whatever, you know, uh, even some Pink Floyd every now and then if I have to be in the mood, you know, but uh, it's, I try to read other people's books, but I don't really have the time as much as I want to devote to that. Like it's taken me, I think three or four years to be almost to the end of Anne Hillman's first book. So, because yeah. I'm doing so many things, I tend to try to read when I can, which is not very often, but uh, yeah, right. Yeah. I don't do much outside of the house, uh, no hunting, no fishing, and so forth. I don't, I don't have the impetus to go do that. Um, so it's like basically, I will watch, I'm a, a sucker for you know, any mystery television, you know, or or uh, series of of TV shows that are on uh, Hulu or whatever it may be, but I find and, and, and watch those. And like when I was writing the first book uh, with that serial killer from the first book, I watched the show, the killing. And that was the guy from 50 shades of gray being the serial killer. And I was watching the show going, this is exactly what I read about and saw that these guys do. He had it down to a T the way he acted in that, in that series. But uh, you know, it's, I found myself watching a lot of either true fiction uh, stuff sometimes, or a lot of uh, Harlan Corbin's books, and and that, that, it's it's one of those things that uh, I, I kind of relax when I watch somebody else's work and try to figure out who did it, and what's going on. Have you ever watched uh, true crime at uh, and then uh, like that to get an idea? of let's say maybe they're interviewing a real serial killer just to see how his mindset works. I did for the first book. Yeah. Because I wanted to get that, that, you know, feeling of what it's like to be inside that head. And um, I think I did sometimes with that because some people go, this is pretty dark, <laughs> but I mean, the, 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 the newest book when silent screams is like a dark reality of what actually happened. So um I see a lot of movies and TV shows that scratch the surface of, of sexual sex trafficking, you know, but uh, this let you and I did interview some people that uh, had lives in that they don't want to read the book. They lived it. They don't want to read it, you know, but uh, their stories led me down that path of making the characters in that more realistic that you would care about each of the person, people that are in there. So I think I did a good job of that. And hopefully a lot of people will agree. Yeah. So where do you get your passion for the characters that, let's say, are completely opposite, like, a, you know, a native female or something or somebody that's, you know, you you are not, you know. <laughs> and uh, so how do you feel that do you go, kind of go around to uh, coffee shops or see people in stores or things like that and kind of pick up characteristics or is this it's just all coming from your imagination? Um, a good 50% is imagination. A lot of it is from people that I've known in my life, uh, drawing from certain people to make one character, you know. Um, it just, reality sets in and you start pulling from people and building a character. So I want to give everybody, nobody's perfect. Everybody has something that's, that's 
with them, you know, that, uh, that sticks with you. So um, a lot of the people that I've dealt with and some people I've talked to face to face have actually uh, been in my mind creating a character. One of the, the characters in my third book there, um, the guy that actually fishes uh, a woman's body out of a lake on the, on the Navajo reservation, I based on a man I actually didn't meet and uh, who was a wealth of information because he actually is the foremost botanist and geologist of the Four Corners area. He does dissertations at colleges and takes university students out in the field and teaches them about, you know, what the rocks and the flora and fauna and so forth. So I, I learned a lot from him. I constantly am referring back to him uh, and what he told me in, in books that I use to develop uh, histories and so forth in the in the in the third like the second book uh, I wanted to find out you know the history of the area and we talked for a good half hour and he said well what do you want to do now I said I'd like to go to some of the locations in the book and have you tell me about them so we went to a few of them there and he opened up about the Navajo history of the area and then geologic formation of the area and all these wealth of information that I had no way of finding out uh, other than talking to him. And he was just a, a joy to, to listen to for days on end. <laughs> that, you know, a couple of days I was out there with him, but it was uh, amazing. So I draw from a lot of people I know and have known during school days or whatever, you know, uh, I actually named one of the characters in the third book, the nickname of one of the guys I worked with uh, a long time ago. So <laughs> I asked him if he ever found his name in the book. <laughs> well, there we go. You got to look out. And now I know Slave Master. <laughs> well, yeah. well, that was like an evil laugh there. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's been <laughs> interesting uh, getting into the mind of Mr. Mark Edward Langley. Now, his newest book is called When Silent Screams. And uh, he hears voices. He needs help. Um, he needs to get out there and pick up a book. Quiet, or quiet. They'll hear you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's, sit- he's sitting with a whole group right now. On there. <laughs> just, he just makes sure he doesn't have a gun. Well, anyway. Um, I always tell people, if you want to watch a movie and find out what a writer's mind is like, watch The Man Who Invented Christmas about Charles Dickens. It is exactly the way it is. Well, there, there we go. <laughs> See, we'll never have him live in the studio because we just never know. Um, <laughs> well, we appreciate this. Uh, so uh, thank you for coming on the show. Um, and uh, we'll talk again. I love being here. Thank you very much. Nice speaking with you, Mark. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, All shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.